Hello, uh, my name is Martin Weiman. I'm with Arm and I'm the product manager for the A profile architecture. Uh, this is my first Lenara Connect, so uh, it's nice to be with you, if only virtually. Uh, what I plan to go through in this session is the uh, changes and enhancements we're adding to the ARM architecture in the A profile in 2020. Uh, so a little bit of history before we jump into this year's extensions. Since the introduction of ARM V8, quite a few years ago now, we've maintained an annual dot uh, X extension, which we bring out every year. And the idea of this is to continue evolving the architecture as we get used in more markets, as we, as computing itself evolves, we find new problems and new things we want to tackle. And so new features we want to put into the architecture. Um, so this is my first Lenar Connect, but my predecessor, Matthew Gretton Dan, and before him, David Brash, we've come to Lenaro most years to talk about what we've added. So to give you examples of things we've done in the past, in 2014 as part of 8.1, we had the VHE, that's uh, virtualization host extensions to support hypervisors like KVM. Last year, in fact, it was Nigel Stevens who presented and we had things like the uh, support for GEM, so generic uh, matrix operations and BFLOAT16. So, we think this program is very important. It allows us to continue evolving the architecture, adding more features, and we maintain this annual cadence to give predictability to the ecosystem, to you guys, so you know when things are going to land, when we're going to provide things like register XML. Um, and that allows that to feed into downstream projects like compilers and kernels and so on. So that's in previous years, what are we adding in this year in 2020? Uh, well, uh, no surprising for guessing that this year's extension is called 8.7. We're nothing not imaginative in when we uh, increment the number. And the highlights this year are ex uh, expanding support for 52-bit addressing. We have support for PCI hot unplug, some uh, extra atomic operations, changes to WFI and WFE to add a timeout option, and improvements to PAN, that's privilege access never. Now, in previous talks, we've also introduced the idea of future architecture technologies or FAT. So this is uh, as yet unreleased versions of the architecture, but we use this program to give advanced access to features we will add in future versions. And we're also this year announcing two features as part of that FAT program, branch record buffer and call stack recorder. So if we start with the 8.7 features. So the first of this year's features is, relates to 52-bit addressing. The original 8.0 architecture had support for 48-bit virtual and physical addresses. We expanded that to 52 bits in ARM 8.1, um, but there was a limitation on that enhanced support, specifically that you could only use it if you had a 64K translation granule. Now that's fine for some operating systems and distributions, but not all, um, notably things like Android use a 4K granule, and therefore they were unable to access this feature we added. Um, so as part of this year's extension, 8.7, we're going to expand uh, access to the larger address spaces to the 4K and 16K granules. Um, in that sense, it's not particularly revolutionary. This is a feature you probably already know how to use. The architectural impacts are relatively low. So for example, you know, we changed the limits on the field that records the size of the address space. However, there's one thing to point out, and that is in order to cover the extra address space with 4K granules, we need an extra level of table. So we go from a maximum of four levels to a maximum of five. And as we already went from zero to three, the new level is called, slightly confusingly, minus one. The next feature we're going to introduce is relates to hot unplug of devices. Um, I've entitled the slide uh, PCIe hot unplug, but it applies to other technologies as well. So imagine a system where you have uh, devices plugged into your laptop. Um, such as the machine that I'm using to make this recording on. Um, 
if I unplug a device uh, unexpectedly, it's possible that that device was still being used, that there's outstanding transactions to the device at the point I pulled the plug out. That's fine, the bus technology support this, so if we take the example of PCIe, it will return a uh, default response after a timeout period. That timeout is typically in the range of 50 milliseconds. Now, on the human scale, that's not very long at all, but in a computing scale, if you've got, say, a two gigahertz processor, that's an awful lot of cycles. Now, there's not a huge amount we can do about this. Uh, the application that's directly interacting with that device is going to be uh, impacted because it has to wait for the timeout. But what we do want to avoid is other unrelated threads being um, affected. So the example here is if I say unplug my USB keyboard, that shouldn't affect anything that's not actively talking to that device at the moment. I don't expect, say, a glitch in video playback. Why might that occur? Well, here's an example. So we have our two cores. The first core is directly is interacting with the device that's been unplugged and it's blocked on the timeout. On another core, we have a different unrelated thread uh, executing, and that thread is going to issue a trans uh, TLB invalidator, TLBI, followed by a DSB. Now, the way that works on ARM is that will be broadcast over the fabric, and uh, the other core also has to perform the, the TLB invalidate, and will send a response back when it's not only done the invalidate, but there are no trans, uh, transactions relying on that translation. Now, in theory, because this is an unrelated thread, it should be able to do that pretty quickly, but it's not using that memory. The issue is that on some implementations, they don't track which TLB entry a outstanding transaction belongs to. So the way, we, they, the way they deal with TLB invalidates is just to wait for all transactions to complete, and that way you're safe. The issue is that one of our transactions is now very slow because it's to an unplugged device, and now both cores are waiting on the timeout, and that could cause jitter in the other thread, which we, is the thing we wanted to avoid. So, what are we doing to fix this? It's uh, we're adding a new attribute that you can assign to a region of address space. It's called XS. And in essence, it, tell, it allows software to say whether regions are fast or slow. What we mean by that is whether they could experience um, de delay, for example, due to a timeout. So we'd mark our uh, PCIe devices as XS equals one, so potentially subject to these delays. We'd mark other regions such as memory or on-chip devices that can't be unplugged as XS zero, so fast. And now we don't have to uh, track the entire translation entry, but if we track whether a transaction is fast or slow, when we get TLBIs in, we can check the attribute of the TLBI against the attribute of the outstanding transactions. It gives us a relatively cheap and effective way of seeing if there are outstanding accesses of the correct type. And if not, we can reply to the TLBI, TLBI quickly and thereby reduce the impact on other threads. So it's a low impact way of avoiding this kind of scenario. Um, sticking on the subject of things like PCIe and accelerators, uh, another feature we are adding this year is 64 byte atomics. Um, I'm getting so used to talking about 64 bits that I do sometimes get that wrong, apologies in advance, but these are 64 byte, not bit atomics. Um, they look like st load and store instructions, uh, apart from obviously they take more data or load or store more data. Um, these operations are designed for talking to accelerators where often they work on the basis of um, a queue. So you enqueue a work item or you dequeue a work item. And some accelerators support the ability to report whether that enqueue operation succeeded, there was space on the queue, or failed, there wasn't space. So we provide three variants of the store instruction, a simple 64 byte store, a 64 byte store with a fail or return, a bit like the way load and store exclusives work. And a third variant which has the fail or succeed status, but also replaces the bottom 32 bits of the written data with that from a register called AC data. As mentioned, there is also a load version of this instruction. Um, 
which just returns 64 bytes of data. As mentioned, they are intended for accelerators. These aren't really for memory operations. We don't expect you to do these to say RAM. And so part of the restriction on them is that you can only do them to, uh, to addresses marked as non-cache. Another feature we're adding this year is variants of the WFE and WFI instruction. Uh, they, these variants now include a timeout. So WFE, WFI, for those of you who haven't come across them, they put the core into standby, so effectively clock gate. Uh, it's a relatively quick and simple way of getting in and out of a low power state. And they're typically used when waiting on a resource to become free if you think the wait is going to be relatively short. One issue with them is that they have uh, the, the amount of time you can be asleep is unbounded, and that is there's wake up event, an interrupt for WFE, uh, sorry, for WFI, an event for WFE, um, and until you get those, you'll stay asleep. Um, it's quite possible that you only want to sleep for a certain amount of time because you don't want to waste potential processing time, and if the event doesn't happen early enough, you'll yield to the scheduler and go do something else instead. You can do that in today's architecture, but that involves you setting up something like um, the generic timer to set a periodic event that's relatively uh, high overhead for what should be a cheap operation. So to address this, we're adding a new version of both instructions, WFET, WFIT, the T for timeout, and they allow you to specify alongside the instruction a timeout. And if the, one of the regular wake up events has not occurred by the time the timeout elapses, then you wake up anyway. So it's a way of putting a maximum time that you wish to be asleep for. The way this is encoded is uh, it's a value that's compared against the system counter. So the standard time that is used for all the built in timers, we use the same thing. And it's important to say it is time, not cycles. So if you're doing things like DVFS, it, it's not going to change how long you're asleep for. Uh, the final one of the 8.7 extensions for 2020 is uh, relates to PAN. This is another 8.1 feature, privileged access never. And it's a way of uh, preventing accidental referencing of user space data for, with kernel permissions. So if I'm in exception level one, EL1, running kernel code, which is privileged, I should not be ordinarily accessing user space data, or if I am, I know I'm doing it and it should be deliberate. So to avoid sort of accidental references, if you enable PAN, then if you use regular load and install instructions with kernel permissions to use the data, you get a fault. Um, the way this was encoded was it looked at whether EL0 had read permission, data read permission in the AP bits. Um, as um, a security researcher pointed out, and if you're interested in the background, I've given a link to their blog. There's a, an issue with the way we did this, which is uh, if you have execute only memory that is uh, in EL0, that's still EL0 memory, but it doesn't have the read permission. It only has the execute permission because PAN is tied to the read permission, not the execute you could dereference executable EL0 memory uh, even with PAN um, enabled. That's not desirable. It also gets in the way of some other features. For instance, uh, JITs wanted to use execute only pages. So to fix this, we are adding a new mode bit in the system control registers, which allow you to either have the traditional PAN behavior or to also block access to user space execute only memory. So those are the 8.1 features. It's, uh, we cover quite a few different areas, but I hope you uh, find those interesting and we will be making register XML and instruction XML available in the near future. It should be going live on ARM's developer site pretty much any time now. Um, finally then for this slot, we're going to look at some features we're adding as part of future architecture technologies. So we actually announced the Future Architecture Technologies program in the beginning of last year in 2019. And it's a way of getting information out about versions of the architecture which are not yet released or announced, 
we want to get this information out to enable the ecosystem, start looking at the technology, start building support for them. Um, so there were two features which were adding to the already uh, announced features. So announced last year was SVE2 and TME. We're now adding BRBE and CSRE to that list. What are these for? Um, well, the sort of subheading on the slide, uh, previous slide sort of gave it away, which is it's about improved invisibility of how your code is running on an ARM-based system. So we want to know um, what's hot in, in our code. So uh, we want to do things like um, heat graphs. Uh, we want to be able to draw diagrams like this and then feed that information into auto FDO tools we also want to be able to um, uh, analyze our code and produce things like call stacks and uh, call tree analysis. And we want to be able to do this in a way which is as low impact as possible. So we don't uh, can gather this information through things like instrumentation, but that's relatively high impact. We want to run our code normally and still get good visibility as to what's happening. Um, which leads us to the two extensions we're going to introduce this year, which are called CSRE and BRBE. So the first one is the Call Stack Recorder. Um, again, we have very imaginative names. It's an extension that records the Call Stack. So the objective for this is to produce a Call Stack automatically in hardware that can be collected easily and in a form that's easy to consume that's put into memory and can be therefore sampled on something like a periodic interrupt. Um, if when enabled you allocate some memory for the call stack recorder and every time you do a um, something that looks like a function call it will push some information onto the call stack and when you do a, a return it will move that move the point of the call stack so you always have a live view of what is in memory with the usual traps available for things like virtualization. And this can be controlled separately for different exception levels, so you can record different things at once. Alongside that, we also have the branch record buffer. So the previous extension gave you a view on what your current call stack was. This uh, extension gives you a view of the last few branches. So it's a way to capture a sequence of branches, again, in an easy to consume form. And we think that this is useful for things like um, feedback uh, tools that use feedback analysis, for example. It needs to be um, low overhead, which should impact the performance of the processor. And it needs to be in a form that's easy to consume. We have things like ETM trace um, today, but the issue with that is it's in a format that's quite difficult to decode. Um, so we want something that's easier for tools to be able to analyze. So the branch record buffer, every time you do a branch, it records the source, the A, the target VA, and some information about the type of branch, was an exception, function call, etc. And it records these in registers. So you get 32 records stored in 96 registers. So unlike the previous extension, this isn't in memory, it's in registers. And we again would sample that periodically and feed that into a profiling or analysis tool. So those are the, the uh, extensions we're introducing in this year. So it's part of the 2020 year updates to the architecture. As I mentioned in passing earlier, we will be making the uh, register XML and instruction set XML available on ARM's website in the near future if it's not already there. Um, if you this is the URL if you want to go look at it. At the time I took the screenshot, it was still 8.6 rather than 8.7, but that should be updated fairly soon. We also expect an updated architecture reference manual uh, first quarter of next year, hopefully in January. And uh, I hope you found it interesting and useful. I will be online for a bit longer to take questions and I look forward to talking to you.